Another good measure of supply, how successful you are at reducing supply of drugs, is purity on the streets. Uh, purity is a better measure than price because of the problems with illegality prices is very open to quite bizarre fluctuations at times. But purity is a key measure of supply. And we can see there that the, oh, I've got the price actually as well, the street price of heroin in New York City fell by 8% between 1980 and 1999. I've got two prices, haven't I? Okay. Price is big reductions. I'm a bit skeptical about price, to be honest, I wasn't sure. I meant to have purity figures up there. Sorry about that. Okay. Did I not do the purity? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, the, the, the key point actually is that purities increase dramatically. If you brought heroin in the, in the 1980s, it would have been about 10% pure. Now it can be as much as 70% pure. So the purity of heroin on the streets has increased dramatically. And that, for me at least, is a key measure of how successful the police are or are not. Okay. Well, let me turn quickly to a final example, which is firearms. Again, most people believe that if you did legalise drugs, you'd have people being shot on the streets on, on, on a constant basis. So if you did legalise guns, you'd have people being shot on the streets all the time. And if you make drugs illegal, then you have a big impact on the murder rate. And that's certainly how these sort of policies are justified. But again, the evidence to support that sort of view just isn't there. I'll run through a couple of examples. Um, the Republic of Ireland banned firearms in 1971. And the graph here, which is produced by Gary Mauser, who's at Simon Fraser University in Canada from official statistics, it shows that the basically the continuous rise of the murder rate in Ireland after handguns, handguns were, were, were banned, after firearms were banned. And you can see there's just, just a pretty constant rise. So banning firearms has had no positive impact on the murder rate in Ireland. In fact, you've got some peaks, which would be um, uh, problematic for an argument that banning handguns was going to uh, reduce murders. There's similar evidence here from, from um, Jamaica, which similarly banned firearms in 1974. And again, the murder rate continues to rise pretty inexorably. The final trends here from America and uh, the UK, I should say quickly before we start worrying that, that the two scales are different. So the American murder rate is much higher than the British murder rate. But you can see that after the handgun ban in the UK, the murder rate continues to rise where America's has a decline in its murder rate during the same period. So the figures are, the graphs should be separate apart, but to put them together illustrates the point. <clears throat> well, let me quickly say in hopefully three minutes or two minutes why this might be the case. Why might a prohibition fail? Well, one reason is offsetting behavior. That when you ban things or make, introduce any policy intervention, people don't necessarily respond as you expect. So if you remember the window tax in the, I think the, the 17th century, when taxes, taxation was done on the size of people's windows, what people did was they bricked up the windows. And similarly, when you ban, um, say, handguns, what happens is that people just find different ways to kill people. You know, they, they knife them, if you like, or they beat them up, or they put a bomb in the car, rather than shooting them. So people offset behavior. They respond in ways you might not expect. Second point is that to actually prohibit something successfully, requires A, an enormous amount of money, and B, a willingness to really be completely draconian. So I think the Taliban, say, may have prohibited alcohol in Afghanistan quite successfully, but only because they're willing to publicly ex execute people for drinking. So unless you're willing to go that far, again, I think you're not going to be successful. Third thing is that it addresses symptoms rather than the cause of social problems. So if you want to reduce the murder rate, the question is really, why do people kill one another? You know, what are the underlying problems here? If you want to reduce the drug in intake, again, the question is, why do people take drugs? What are the underlying social problems? Simply addressing the symptom, not the cause, isn't going to solve the problem. And finally, there's a notion of forbidden fruit, which, again, very good evidence from lots of studies that when you make something illegal, it makes it more attractive, especially to young people. And some really good comparative studies in America where they've changed the law you can buy cigarettes, and where the, the, the law rises to 18, the number of young people smoking tends to increase. And I believe there's early evidence that that's happened in the UK too in the last couple of years. So making something illegal makes it attractive to some people, and particularly people likely to take drugs. So let me just close with uh, three points. First, I think that there's moral and practical arguments that you can make against prohibitions that I've just set out. Um, ideally, more time would be good. But in a, in a short time, those are the arguments. The second point is that the cost of prohibitions usually fall on the most vulnerable people in society. So the people I think are really paying the penalty of prohibitions 
isn't, if you like, middle-class university students in, in the UK or lecturers like me. It's people in Edinburgh taking heroin or people in Mexico living in the barrios. It's the most vulnerable people in society who I think pay the highest cost. A third point, and the final most important point in lots of ways, is that to make these sort of arguments, you don't have to believe in drugs, prostitution, boxing, gambling, all these things. You can believe that these things are morally wrong, but still not wish to prohibit them. Rather, it's the belief that these are moral choices for us as individuals, not for the state of some collective entity. So even if one does believe that all these things shouldn't be done, that's still, in my view, consistent with believing they should be illegal. It's rather asking people to take responsibility for their own actions. And in my view, if they do so, they will behave responsibly. And that, I think, is the basis of a free society. Okay, thank you.